everybody thanks for coming to the Windsor sustainability fair first of first ever uh, we're here at the drive electric uh, panel discussion and we have a, a group of fairly expert people on different aspects of electric vehicles so I'm gonna have them introduce themselves and give a little background of their knowledge and then we'll open up to have the audience members ask questions and engage in discussion so Please don't be shy. If you're curious about something related to electric vehicles, this is a good group of folks to ask about it. So with that said, you're up. Okay. Morning, everybody. My name is Bill Ashley. I come to you from Greenfield, Massachusetts, which is very green, right at the borders of Vermont and New Hampshire, of course. Um, back in um, 2019, I leased a Chevy Bolt EV for three years, and when I got done with the three years, it's the best car I've ever driven, I bought it. So, but along the way, earlier, um, one thing I was focusing on was um, range anxiety, which I've, most people who are looking to, to at electric cars are thinking about. So I challenged that right away, about the third month after I owned the car, I packed up and I drove it to California and back. <laughs> And since then, I've done runs to Florida, to North Carolina. So what I can really give you is, as far as some details about the Bolt EV is what it's like on the big open road out there. Okay? Hey, everybody. My name is Joe Manaski. Uh, I'm one of the founders of Inductive Auto Works. We're an EV conversion shop, so we convert gas and diesel vehicles to electric. We build custom electric vehicles. Um, I'm an engineer by trade a couple years ago, uh, standing around a campfire, actually, a couple of my engineering buddies. We had this conversation, we realized, hey, electric is the future. This is where the world's going, and we want to make sure that there's a place in that future for gearheads like us, that like building cool custom cars, and also want something a little different than what's coming out of the factory. Uh, like I've been hot rodding since the 50s. Our idea is to take that into the modern future of electric vehicles. If you want something from the past, but still just as modern as what's coming off the factory floors today, um, that's what we're here to do. Uh, and I'm here on the panel to offer kind of a technical perspective on anything, anything uh, real nuts and bolts, scat battery, battery chemistries, how your car works, that kind of stuff. Uh, that's the stuff I can offer uh, questions today for. So, thank you. I'm Richard Jordan. I head up the Tesla Owners Club. I was about to put my hands on my pants. Anyhow, um, <clears throat> I took delivery of my car in March 2014, and I now have 215,000 miles on my car. A lot of trips up and down the East Coast and a trip uh, across from San Diego to Connecticut in my brother's uh, Model Ooh. 3 and my wife also owns a Model 3 so we're all oh, electric. Good. So I uh, just pass on experience from really just ownership long term and battery degradation we can get into that too if need be. Right and I, I just realized something uh, I'm Dr. Charles Button. Uh, <laughs> I'm actually an EV owner as well and I've owned uh, three iterations of the Nissan Leaf. I started in 2013 and I leased the LEAF, and then I upped it in, the, in 2017 to the new version, and then uh, we uh, up to the 2019 when it came out, and last year, I was so pleased with the, that version, we bought out the lease. Uh, it was just too good of a deal not to. Um, so yeah, we're all fairly expert. I'm just the moderator, but I might <laughs> chime in a little bit too. So with that said, uh, we'll field some questions, and what we'll do is if you have an EV question, uh, we'd like you to come up and ask your question into this mic right here, just like I'm looking, and one of us will answer, hopefully. If you have a specific question, maybe more geared to a specific area of expertise, uh, you can ask right to them. So with that said, any questions? Hi, my name's Pat. I actually have two questions. Um, one, if you could explain more about what range anxiety is and how that works, because we do a lot of like road tripping and stuff, and it seems like you're stuck within whatever mileage. And then the second one, if you guys have any information about um, the state rebates or uh, federal rebates that 
they're doing for new buyers or used cars or anything like that? I'll let you start. You seem like the range anxiety guy. Uh, okay, uh, on your second question, you've got to ask somebody else, not me. <laughs> that's, that's direct. Uh, range anxiety. Um, with the two scenarios, there's local driving and there's distance driving. Um, you get to know, um, if you know where to look on the net, and I just had a handout here of how to get to plugshare.com, it's called. It'll tell you everything that's in your neighborhood. And you can, it's going to be like driving a gas car. You'll know where the fuel stations are locally, and you'll go there, and it's going to be easy. But um, out, in the, out in the open road, uh, that takes some more planning. Um, um, and you were, I, I, what I do, I, I'm sort of a Luddite as far as a lot of technology. I actually go and check the routes on plugshare.com is the site. And I write it out on a spreadsheet, you know, where to get on, where to get off, where the place is, local directions, you get off the interstate thing, where do I find this particular location, left, right, and center to go to? Um, the, the big uh, names out there are Electrify America. That's uh, what's called the high level chargers, the fast charging, which is for those who know electricity, that's, that's direct current to direct current. There's no conversion, so it's pump it in there. And you get like 160 miles per hour added to your range. Um, and you got to go find those things, those places. But PlugShare will take you, uh, if there's trouble and there's something, the machines aren't quite right or something, you get back on, on, on PlugShare. Uh, where's the nearest um, other one for, for, a, um, for a fallback? So you can have confidence that way as far as, as distance is concerned. And you'll know your local uh, area, like I said. Yeah, yeah, so why don't we continue with the range anxiety yeah, topic? I'm sure you got a little to add. To yeah, experience. so this will be specific to Tesla's. Um, all the charging stations are in the screen. Does anybody remember what AAA triptych was? It's built into the car. So, um, I mean, one could go to PlugShare or Electrify Americas. That's another national uh, fast charging network. You go, if you have their app, you can look at their website and see where all the chargers are. Um, range anxiety, it doesn't exist once you own a car, once you own an EV, that, that goes away. Um, I mean, a lot has changed with the amount of chargers around the road now versus back in, like when I took delivery in my car, there were three Tesla chargers in all of New England. Wow. <laughs> First one, by the way, was put in Darien at the rest area, and it's still, they've expanded it, but there were only three. Um, so that was fun, uh, <laughs> um, but I was doing mostly local driving anyhow, but three, four months later, we took our trip, we took a trip to North Carolina and, but, but the point is all of it is there. You don't need to worry about it because just as like you have a, a gasoline car, there was a time when there weren't gas stations in every town. So it's going to change. And your gas gauge doesn't have numbers on it as far as how many miles are left. You just get a feel for how far your car can go. It's the same thing. Okay. Yeah. Right. So I, wouldn't, I really wouldn't worry about that. Yeah. Running around town, you're, you're going to get used to what your car, and you just come home and you plug it in. Right. Every, whether you drove five miles or 150 miles, plug it in, just like your phone. Road trips. You have Tesla's network, if, if you have a Tesla and it's all there, or as he was saying, you, you'll have Electrify America's uh, map there and PlugShare, which is crowdsourced. So. so I'm just curious, uh, who out here does not have an EV, but is considering getting maybe an EV, right? So just one of you. All you guys have EVs? All right, so I maybe don't need to get into it, but there's a couple that don't. Right, so what range anxiety, to answer your original question, what range anxiety is, is the um, concern or the anxiety that you might run out of electricity while you're on a drive into your destination, right? So if you think of a regular gasoline vehicle, uh, depending on its miles per gallon, right, you can typically get anywhere depending on if it's a gas guzzler, maybe 250 miles on a full tank, but if it's a really efficient vehicle, you might be able to get three to 400 miles on a full tank, right? So it would be the same anxiety you might have when you're riding down the road and the 
in, the, in your gas car and you see the things pointing at E almost, you're like, oh man, I'm gonna run out of gas, right? So it's the same thing with the electric. It's the anxiety you might run out. Related to that, they've talked about charging, right? So you can charge your electric vehicles at three different levels and then Tesla's kind of their own thing in a way because they set up their own charging systems. And for the Tesla owners, uh, with their chargers, although I hear it maybe might change, my understanding is that only Teslas can plug into them, right? For the yeah, most part? Yeah, they, they did. There's an adapter now, right? Yeah, that was for the, they put those in New York and uh, in California yeah. as a test, but they are gonna come out with a fourth generation of chargers. I won't get into all this. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. But the thing is, they've already installed them in Europe and the connector on it will enable all uh, non-Teslas to use a Tesla charger. Yeah, chargers. soon, right? Really yeah. soon. Uh, it, there, it should be happening probably at the end of the year. They'll start installing them in this country. Um, and it charges much. I, I want to say it charges much faster, but you're kind of limited on how much the car can handle. Like the Chevy Bolt, is there, there's a limit how much DC fast charging can accept. Exactly. Right. About 53 kilowatts. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it's, it's limited. Um, whereas, but even my wife's three charges a hell of a lot faster than, <laughs> than my car because different battery chemistry, right. different cabling. So, so it's all advancing quick. It's all advancing. It, it's literally as we're speaking, there are advancements being made with the battery systems, and there are three basic levels of charging: uh, level one, level two, level three. Right, and so level one is just plug it into an outlet like you would a, a lamp or something, and let it sit overnight. You get roughly, I get anywhere from like four to maybe eight miles per hour, That's depending right. on the type of plug I'm plugging into. Um, outlet, you know, and then there's level two, which is a little, you know, more per hour. What five maybe, times as much, from uh, five to Yeah, 10, right about maybe 20 to 30 miles, right. roughly, on the average, per hour on a level two, and a lot of people will get a level two charger set up right at their, at their, uh, at their house. Um, and then there's the level three, which is the quick charge. And for a quick charge, I, I haven't seen new stats for them, but I think you can probably get... It can be five times a gallon, like more like 125 yeah. miles per hour. Per every hour, charge. right? Yeah. So more like... Those installable at home? No. That's you can, no. but it's pricey. It's yeah. very pricey, yeah. yeah. Uh, big, yes, but... Yeah. If you have yeah, 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 yeah. It's resident, residential, it's commercial grade power. But okay. I wanted to mention two more things. Uh, you mentioned there were only three in all of New England. At the time, What's yeah. your guesstimate now in all of New England? Just uh, Tesla alone. Uh, well, a hundred. At or least, more. right? Yeah. And that's just the Tesla ones. And if you add in a charge point and the other mm -hmm. systems that they've mentioned, I mean, at Central, at Central Connecticut State University alone, we have 14 of them throughout campus. And that's just one campus, right? And mm -hmm. I don't have to go very far to find two next to a restaurant in Newington or yeah, two really next. Yeah, we're in a time of exponential growth with with yeah, I mean, we, side we used to have one here in town until some teenagers decided they didn't like it and they ran over it. <laughs> they picked the one charging station yeah. to destroy when they They're wrecked. supposed Anyways, to go cow tipping, not so, electric cars. Um, <laughs> when I first got my first EV, I was a little anxiety maybe, but I was using it to go to and back work, so not a whole lot. I have zero anxiety right now. I know I'm going to find somewhere to charge. Anyway, so hey, right. other questions? Can I add something on that? Yeah. We didn't bring up um, the lap of luxury you can get with an electric car. If you have a, <coughs> a garage that's attached to your house and, and, you're, and you own, you're not a, you don't have a landlord, um, you run a 240 volt um, circuit into the garage and you have um, the level two you can plug in. You come home at night, you plug the thing in. In the morning, it's full. Yeah, uh, it's it's better than those convenience store. You know? Yeah, <laughs> say a little bit about that. It's a it's a little bit different mentality, right? You're not filling up your tank and then oh, I'm a little bit, I'm an eighth, I gotta go fill up. You're basically you're starting every day with a quote unquote full tank. It's a little Absolutely. bit of a different kind of mentality, uh, kind of a little bit different than what you think about driving a gas car or an electric car. Because really, if you if you own that, you're charging at home in some capacity. 
Um, so you're, you're basically starting every day. And it's really like these other guys mentioned, on those long trips is when it requires, you know, a little bit of extra planning, a little extra right. thought. But it's really that day-to-day, -day, that daily, you're starting every single day with max range. Uh, so it's not as much to think about. Um, I know you asked about uh, rebates as well, so I will give you a tiny bit of information that I have. I think we all purchased our cars long enough ago that we didn't get to take advantage of the most current ones, um, but a close friend of mine recently did purchase a plug-in hybrid, so I have a little bit of info. They have recently opened them back up, and it is in the form of a tax rebate uh, at the end of the year. Um, I'm not going to tell you numbers because I don't want to be wrong and I don't know them. Uh, but they are available for used cars, I believe, as long as they're 2016 or newer, um, both full electric and plug-in hybrid. So, um, yeah, I believe the Connecticut website, the cheaper rebate is what it's called. You can find more detailed information. But if you are considering a full electric or plug-in hybrid, there are uh, significant tax incentives uh, to help. Um, and find out about those before you go to the dealership. Don't rely on your dealership knowing about them. Um, most dealerships are not well-versed on them, it seems like, right now. Uh, and also, you can use that to your advantage, right? They don't know that you're getting another five grand or whatever it is back from the government off what they're selling it to you for. So um, do a little research if you're in that position, but they're out there, uh, and it is available. It's too many moving parts to that. Yeah. 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 Agreed. It's That's why agreed. trying to find more. About oh, wait, she, on, she, she, has, she has a question. Yeah, so wait, hang on, we can't hear you. You thought you were going to get out of doing that, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, two questions. Um, first, with the um, distance anxiety, I've heard, and you can just confirm if it's true or not, that um, unlike gas, when you're stuck in traffic, you're burning gas, but when you're stuck in traffic, an electric vehicle, if the wheels aren't turning, then you're not. That's, that's what true. I've heard. Is that true? Not okay. Least, so then you don't have to. Too. That was my concern. Is like yeah. if you're stuck in traffic somewhere, you're. No. Um, and then um, my second question is, um, how do you reconcile the whole environmental impact with the with regard to the batteries? And I've also heard something recently where the material to um, make the batteries is a limited resource. So just mm -hmm. curious to hear kind of how you counter that. Yeah. Uh, we'll go ahead. Sure. So I'll, I'll say um, largely that's misinformation. So um, the environmental impact uh, of an EV, in including cost of production and everything, is offset, I believe, to net zero somewhere in the first 50 to 60,000 miles, depending on the vehicle. That includes everything. Uh, the mining of the batteries, all of that, versus a gas vehicle, which is continuing to pollute and put CO2 into the air, obviously never reaches that. So is there a more significant impact on production? Yes, but that is very quickly offset when it comes to actually driving and burning those things. Um, I'm not going to deny that battery resources right now are rare earth metals. Uh, I will say there is very, very small amounts of those metals in batteries. Um, the majority of mining for those materials is still consumed by things like cell phone and laptop batteries, far away electric cars at this point. Um, I will also add that there is, uh, you touched on the amount of money and time by governments and corporations being poured into battery research right now is unlike, I think, anything we've ever seen in the history of mankind. There is so much right now on the horizon of uh, the future of batteries um, that I think we will quickly move away from these very rare metals. I know Tesla alone is um, doing a lot of stuff with the silica, basically mining materials out of sand. Um, there's solid state batteries. There's, there's so much on the horizon of batteries that I think um, even the small concern that that it is today, and I think that concern gets a little bit overblown. Um, it's not zero, though. I'm not going to say that it's zero, but I think that will very quickly uh, go away, certainly within our lifetimes. Anything go ahead? The, uh... On that note, yeah, there's a bunch of minerals that need to be dug up. But the minerals that were mined for my battery was done over nine years ago. Mm -hmm. However, comma, I guarantee nobody with a gasoline car is still running on the gas the car had when they bought it. Exactly. <laughs> and never mind the shipping, the, the drilling of the oil in the Middle East, tankering it all the way to the Gulf of Mexico and the whole refining and all that other stuff. Um, that's something they come, they tend to forget. The other thing, and anybody can look this up, uh, in order to refine oil, you have to use cobalt. It's called desulfurcation. They have to do that to the oil to get, obviously, rid of the sulfur to refine it into uh, to gas. So that's something that doesn't get said. And then lastly, on the advancement of battery technology, when my car was new, 
I have an 85 <clears throat> kilowatt battery. The range new was 265 miles. My wife's 2022 Model 3 with a smaller battery pack, I think it's 73 kilowatts, 358. Mm -hmm. Smaller wow. battery pack, newer battery cells, yeah. and it just keeps getting, the, it, the improvement is just, and, and the charging rate, my car is slow. I'll, I'll see 150 miles an hour. When you, my wife's car got down to 20%, we're using one of the Tesla chargers, we saw 1,000 miles an hour. I mean, before you got out of the car, there was already 10 miles out of the battery. You know, it's just, so literally, you pull in, plug in, go use the bathroom, come back out, unplug, drive on. But there, there's so many variables, how fast one's car can charge the side of the battery, but it's advancing so quickly. Yeah. You want to add? Yeah, uh, I'd like to address another part of your question, uh, which is the end recycling angle. Um, I've heard um, that it's not a very big industry right now, there's not many places to do it, but the cars haven't worn out yet, so it's going to be a, a, a session for that to come up and re, you know recycle all, all these materials, particularly the battery packs, all, all small. By the way, the battery packs are tiny, well, at least in the Chevy uh, Bolt EV, they're just small, tiny, um, you know, tubular, and they're along the entire chassis of the car. They're not like in a box. They're all on the chassis. There's a company called Redwood out of California. It was started by, um, I forget his first name already. Yes, thank you. Um, so we really don't know his name. We just know the initials, but anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> we know the last name. But um, he started a company to recycle the batteries. And there's other companies that are getting into it because there are cars that, while they may not have worn out yet, they've gotten into wrecks. True. And the battery packs are where the money is because glass is glass. There's no money in it, but the point is yeah. recycling is, or they'll repurpose the batteries for battery storage. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. that, that addresses another, sorry. <laughs> that addresses another question, which is um, another sort of, um, negative is how long the batteries last and the cost to replace them because obviously one of the benefits of an EV is the low maintenance, low you know ongoing cost, but is it really offset by the point when you need a battery that's very costly? So Well, I've, I, I said earlier, I have 215,000 miles in my car now and for the average driver, that's about 15 years of typical driving. According to the EPA, the average now is 13,500 miles a year that a, a typical driver does. So you do the math, and I think that's out to about 15 years. Yeah, it's, it's a rare instance that one of them fails. Yeah. Yeah, and it's I pretty still, rare. I, I, I have not met anyone that had that happen yet. I still have 90% of my original range. And the nice thing about EVs related to the topic of batteries is um, they tend not to just get to a point and then fail. So much like a lot of solar panels, their lifetime is expected to be around 20 years. Some of the panel, solar panels, heck, they'll last 30, 40 years, right? So the only difference is, uh, even much like a gas car, once they start to get older, you get 10, 15, 20 years out, you might not get the full 100% uh, charge when you charge, you might only get 80%. Mm -hmm. But it's still functional. And then the other point I wanted to make since we were talking about myths, um, I have yet to find out where you plug in your gas car and get energy from solar panels for it. <laughs> right. right. You never get to do that with a gas car. Right? Or hydro, or wind, so, uh, a you potato know. with a, two nails and a what? No, no. Uh, and and I, one final point for battery uh, technology. Uh, there's a handful of new technologies that have just come out in the last year. One of them, uh, the battery will last for a, a million miles. Wow. So I don't know of many vehicles that last a million miles, but hey, I'm worth willing to give it a shot. Right. Yeah. Uh, and uh, for range, right, most gas cars, the best range you're going to get is maybe 350, 400 miles. Some are a little higher that are good MPG. The, the Lucid Air gets how much now? 
Like well, 500? they claim 500 and change, but you got to look how big that battery pack is. Well, I'm is. just saying, though, it's it, the range is there. Yeah, that right? is. Right? So if range is your problem, there are cars that can get you four or 500 right. miles on one charge, one full charge. Yeah, right? I mean, I, personal They're pricey. Opinion, <laughs> right, and that's kind of the trade-off. Personal opinion, I think we're going to start seeing manufacturers kind of stop around that 500 mile yeah. range because I think once infrastructure, and we're already – well on the way to that trajectory. Once infrastructure catches up, we have chargers everywhere. No one's going to want to pay for a thousand miles of range in a car because you don't need it, right? That's like lugging around 30, 40 gallons of gas in your sedan. You don't need that, right? If you know you can charge quickly in anywhere you go, a smaller battery pack is cheaper. It's a lighter car. Exactly. It's less wear and tear. Yeah. So I think this whole kind of range conversation is, again, as we advance the technology, going to quickly become a thing of the past. Yeah, exactly. that's right. So someone had a question... She did. Liz. Oh, why would this guy Come up here. Oh. <laughs> you don't get out of it either. You get out of it. I <laughs> <laughs> actually don't have a question. I was just going to comment a little bit on experience um, for myself. So I just, uh, I just got a used um, Chevy Bolt, which is going to qualify for the, um, for the, the used tax credit, the federal tax credit. Um, the, the Connecticut tax credit is for used cars is a uh, is based on income, so um, that one's a little bit more confusing. But um, yeah, it's a thirty percent it's a thirty percent tax credit up to four thousand dollars. So thirty percent, right? The thirty percent the cost of the car up to three thousand dollars, and the car has to be has to be less than twenty five thousand dollars. It's my understanding, and maybe this is the federal one, the federal rebate is based on your tax liability, so, correct? Okay. Yeah, I mean. So you need to have a, about, about a $7,000 tax liability in order for it to be worth it, because that's what you're getting back. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, okay. yeah, it's, a, it's a rebate, yeah. So. Right. Okay. Yep. Backwards. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, uh, and then the other thing, uh, uh, talking about batteries, um, so the Chevy Bolt just had its battery replaced because, of course, they were replacing batteries on the Bolts. Um, but it, so it came with a eight, um, eight year warranty, right. um, you know, so, <laughs> so Chevy's pretty confident. <laughs> I think, I think about, most manufacturers are at least a hundred thousand. I was just going to say, it's, yeah. it's my leaf, it's a hundred thousand. Yeah. It's a hundred thousand eight year warranty. So yeah, I'm not too concerned about that. Yeah. yeah. So is the minimum, um, I think. Yeah. And I do want to say, uh, as far as uh, range anxiety goes, I've driven my car back and forth to Vermont over and over again and, um, in, in the wintertime. So range anxiety is a real thing in the winter. Yes. <laughs> I do want to say that. It really is a real thing. Um, but the number of charging stations that are on my route has increased right. um, in, in the time that I've been doing it, in the last five years that I've been doing it. So there are, there are more and more charging stations. So, and that's been a good thing, but yeah, the cold, even if you're sitting in traffic, if you're running your heat, it is going to deplete your car. So, <laughs> just so Le you know. Electrify America, <laughs> I don't know if you've done it, uh, Electrify America has an agreement with Walmart. A lot of Walmarts will have Electrify America chargers, which are DC fast charging. Mm -hmm. that's cool. So, nice. and the nice is they're open 24 hours a day, generally. Right. That's so, one of the criticisms of the Tesla network, but that's a side conversation. So, <laughs> so they don't exactly. So of course, you, know you need is the the most is a lot the, of Walmart are open twenty four seven. The right. mother of ingenuity, or whatever that saying is. But um, so what I done? So one of the things you have heated seats in your car. That's absolutely. If you get a car, an electric car, get heated seats because <laughs> it's like it's an essential thing. And and then what I did in order not to run my heat in the car. I, I got heated socks, <laughs> and I got heated long underwear, and man, that's the best thing ever, and you don't have to run the car heat, and then yeah, the car a, goes as far as I want it to. Yeah, yeah I wanted to add something uh, if, if we've missed so far. We talked about the fast charging and the, what they call a trickle charge, which is the five miles per hour it's plugged in. Level one. Level one. Also trickle, mm -hmm. which is, you know, good description. Um, there's a company called ChargePoint, which has, uh, and not exactly a network, but there are level two, the medium one, 25 miles an hour, all over the United States, and it's a very good company. The machines are very uh, good, yeah. and, you can, and you, when you get on the, the plugshare.com, you'll see 
charge point stations a lot around. Uh, very good outfit, uh, very good to work with. So they're very good for local charging when you're away from home. Right, and then I guess another decent point to make is, in Connecticut at least, and I imagine most states, if you were um, installing a charging system in your facilities parking lot, um, a lot of them don't charge you to use it, um, right? And not all of them, but you know, you come to if you're coming to Central for some reason, yeah, a meeting, a, an event, bringing your kids there, you get to plug in for free. You know, um, that's absolutely true in Massachusetts. Um, um, you know, right now there's about. 3% market penetration for electric cars. Yeah. So it makes sense for the, that power to be, the medium level power to be free. But you know, turn that around, there's 97% penetration of electric vehicles, which is what we're heading for. That will probably be a charge everywhere. That and that's fair sure. enough. Question? Do any of you have any special insight into um, the outlook for making electric vehicles more accessible and affordable for people of limited means who are disproportionately affected by climate change beyond just the, you know, if we make it more <coughs> common, then, you know, prices will come down. Are there any special insight into that? On price, on price. Uh, it's, it just well, they, have, they, have, they, they have to they they have to make they have to make the cars they have to make the cars cheaper, um, and, and the big expense is the cost of, of the batteries. Um, there was also I'm sure many of us in here remember when a cell phone cost like ten thousand dollars or whatever. Now everybody's got a, just about everybody has a cell phone. So the cost of that has come down. So eventually the cost of electric cars will come down, but like any new technology, it's, I mean, I won't get into it, but what I pay for my car, and I have a Model S, what a Model S costs today, I got robbed. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I don't have, I got parking centers, but I don't have auto steer, autopilot, whatever. I mean, my wife's car blows mine out of the water. It's faster and so on and so forth. It's just a matter, it's the, it's the cost of the batteries. It's what it really comes down to. And, and they're gonna find cheaper materials. Uh, Tesla has, I'm gonna botch this up, iron phosphate batteries. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are no nickel or cobalt used. And, and as long as we can make batteries in our country using minerals that we have in our country that are readily available and iron is everywhere that brings down the price and make it more affordable and then we're talking about the longevity when these cars get used go into the used car market they'll get cheaper and cheaper so, so i'm going to add a little piggyback on your point uh, there are some very reasonable reasonably priced ev electric vehicles right now i know for the leaf yeah, I can get a leaf for under thirty thousand. Um, a used leaf that now they've been around long enough. Uh, one of my colleagues just bought a used leaf for fifteen thousand oh, okay. bucks. Huh? Ben got hers for thirteen thousand. Thirteen thousand, right? So you don't have to buy new anymore. There's a they're starting to pop up as used vehicles. I don't know what a bolt is, but it's fairly. Re although they're not making new ones anymore, <laughs> they discontinued it. But the used ones are out there. Even new, what was it approximately? 22000 for a new one there, right? And I think Tesla just announced that they're going to lower the price of one of their models significantly. It changes by the minute what the <laughs> prices are going to be. <laughs> uh, so my point being, uh, we're already starting to see the price reductions come down below thirty, and even getting down to the point of below 25000 for a handful of them. And I think it's going to continue the downward cost trend. The example I remember was uh, when I would, was younger and didn't have gray hair, um, a buddy of mine was, uh, thought he was like the high tech nerdy guy in the school because he got a Texas instrument right. calculator. calculator. <laughs> and I said, well, how much was that? I remember this, he was, he was 900 bucks. And all it did was multiply, divide and subtract and add. That was it. And you know, and that was a calculator. Now they give calculators away, right. you know, and they're solar charged. 
are you going to find used vehicles, EVs, in the same market channels as regular? We're starting to, yes. Yeah. Yep, that's already started. Yep. Go ahead, real quick. I'd like to address your low income uh, viewpoint a little more. Uh, most low income people are do not own their homes. They're renting from a landlord. Okay, people that come maybe on a third floor or something. Um, um, also, that's a that's a limitation. Um, I have never yet found a landlord that is enthusiastic about going electric. So there's apt to be slow to have an actual charging point in your parking lot in an apartment complex. However, what's going to happen, I think, soon is towns um, are going to start offering level two charging around the town hall area, a central point in the town for the people there. And even in densely populated neighborhoods, there could be something on the street that um, is going to allow that. Right now, there's um, a big move in Massachusetts to roll out a lot of level two chargers. And um, so you get to think about where do you put those? And the perfect places are like um, where <clears throat> US highways intersect with interstate highways, which will intersect with uh, state highways. All of those junctions could be state interstate, could be state, um, you know, state U.S. highways. All those junctions would have level two chargers. That that's the vision, and that's going to make it a lot easier for low income people because they're going to know uh, crossroads nearby where they can go charge their cars. Okay. Yeah, a few things to add here. I think um, the apartment issue is a great point, and I think that's something that. Uh, will need to be addressed. More apartment complexes, townhouses, stuff like that will need to install chargers. Uh, I live in an apartment, and when it was time for me to get a new car, uh, for me, an all-electric car was out of the question. I chose a plug-in hybrid. Um, and that's my second point is I think for a lot of people, especially now, plug-in hybrids have been around a little bit longer. Um, there is a decent used car market for plug-in hybrids, and I think that's a great kind of stepping stone, I'll say, um, to going full EV, whether you can't afford it or it doesn't make sense. I mean, it didn't make sense for me. Not being able to charge at home it kind of um, takes one of the big benefits out of it. So getting a plug-in hybrid, I chose a Chevy Volt. Um, so... 50, my first 50 miles are all electric, and then it switches on the gas engine and it goes into a hybrid mode. It's a great kind of middle ground. I get to enjoy 90% of my driving on electric because I'm able to charge at various places uh, around my daily drive, and then I really don't have to worry about it for those the, the longer drives. Um, and it's really a great stepping stone, honestly, into going electric. If you're you're really not sure if it fits um, your needs, uh, a plug-in hybrid, I, I think, is something I recommend to a lot of my friends that live in more rural areas areas that don't have access to the charging and drive further because I think it, it kind of gets you it gets you in the mindset it, it gets you enjoying the benefits for a much lower purchase price mm -hmm. um, and the last point I'll make about uh, price I think competition 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 is the it's going to be our savior there right you know 10 years ago Tesla uh, was basically the only uh, name in the game um, now we have every major manufacturer stepping up and announcing major investments in EV um, in EV models. Uh, and we'll see as more and more of these companies come forth and have put more models into it, have more competition in the market, uh, prices will come down. There'll be a car for every different demographic, every different income level, whether you want a sports car, a luxury car, or an economy car, just like there is now with gas cars. Right. Uh, and I'll make a final point on the cost thing, too, and the incentive thing. Um, under the new, I forget what legislation was just passed, but apparently part of the deal is if, if the EV is an American made, you get even a higher uh, re, um, tax reduction. Yeah. And the batteries right? have to be made. So There's some of them are, parts. and some of them aren't. So that, you know, it's nuanced, right? You need to do a little homework. But you can get a decent amount of tax break especially if it's an American name. Uh, Eric? There's something we all can do at the grassroots level at your local city and town or at the state level, and that's to push for changes in the zoning code to require new apartments that are being built or significantly rehabbed to require the charging infrastructure. Um, some states are a lot more progressive than Connecticut is right now, but we can move that way. For instance, in California, if um, 
the tree landscape in your home allows it, any new home construction requires solar panels. Um, so there's a lot we can do right in this room here with town planning and zoning and our town council mm -hmm. to put that pressure on. Exactly. Yes, uh, how do pickup trucks fit into the uh, electric vehicle picture? I uh, pull um, a fifth wheel RV down to Florida every winter. Is it realistically, is it realistic for me to uh, think about going electric? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I'm gonna be honest with what's on the market right now, probably not. Uh, I think that's something that's coming in the future. I mean, I don't know, realistically, uh, an F-150, I think uh, at max tow rating, you're down under 100 miles of range. Um, if anyone knows different about other models, feel free to correct me. I don't mean to be speaking out of turn here, but I, towing has a very significant effect on, on range. Um, so it really kind of depends on if you're willing to make that a kind of leisurely trip and stop and charge. The chargers are out there, no doubt. Um, the chargers are out there. The F-150 um, specifically, I know, has a very fast charging speed because it's a, it's a newer vehicle. Um, so is it doable? Yes. If we're talking about things like commercial applications where you're a driver every day, um, there's stuff coming, but I, I'm not sure if we're there. Yeah, there's, uh, it's on the cusp, right? Sure, yeah, I, I so definitely. So the technology's moving there. The F-150 is probably your best bet at the moment. Um, there's what, that, um, Rivian? There's the Rivian. Rivian. Yeah, it's there's all another really one. designed for there's a, a half ton at max. Though, there's that's a, what I'm saying. If you there's need a, something bigger. I don't think it's in production yet, but there's a, I think, it, is it Chevy owns Hummer now? Yeah, the Hummer's out. The new Hummer that's supposed to be I coming out is supposed to be up there, too. don't believe it has much of a tow rating because it's You don't want heavy. that. But, um, <laughs> you know, related to the earlier question, I know, right? It's weird to mention Hummer as if it's... Uh, yeah, they... Uh, but, you know, um, they use more materials. So if you get a bigger vehicle, then, you know, you use more of the materials to build it, which means it's not as eco-friendly as the smaller vehicles. But once again, you get solar panels, it kind of offsets a lot of that, but not all of it, right? So, but, and there's a, there's a fleet, I forget who it is, for uh, FedEx, has now in the process of putting on the streets, you know, a lot, you know 18 wheelers. There's commercial that stuff are coming. That's why I say it's definitely coming because there are several companies that are focusing purely on commercial. There's several yeah. companies out that are also so ramping up commercial. So yeah. it's coming. It's on. It's on the cusp. It's really um, battery density probably has to come down a little bit um, because we start running into a yes, you can add more batteries, but now are you actually adding range with that additional weight? Yes. Yeah, so with these long range 18 wheelers coming out, you can, yeah. Obviously, they need to have range. Right? Sure. So. The fact that there's uh, fleets of them starting to be planned indicates it won't be much longer a pickup truck's going to have a longer range. So the F1 California just mandated by 2035 no more diesel trucks can be sold. Well, um, yes. Hopefully no other legislation comes in and revokes yeah, that. Yeah, we got uh, One more comment on the F-150. Uh, I don't know a lot about it, but apparently its sales have been very high. Because if you are some sort of a technical tradesperson, electrician, whatever, um, you get your power source right there. You know, yeah, it's it right there. there. You can pull right off the battery. Yeah, they got and 240 it's terrific volt for that. In it. So it's very but popular. Towing is going to. Hauling eat. is a different story. That, that's going to eat a lot of range. I don't even know if Ford has a tow rating, if they would allow, because a fifth wheel, you got to put that into the, the to the bed of the truck and I don't know exactly where what the space difference is where the battery pack is in the F1 luggage. Yeah. Definitely the, do your homework, but that's uh, probably your best bet. Yeah, I've been 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 time. yeah there's yeah. really nothing out there yeah. like that. Now, I think it's kind of a shame honestly that we Sorry, what was that? I was yeah. talking, I'm sorry. I say I think it's a little bit of a shame the industry kind of skipped over the plug-in hybrids for trucks a little bit too quickly. Yeah. We went, we really, you know, there was some of that in the sedans and stuff, and then we really kind of went to full electric. I think 
a electric pickup with a range extender would be a good fit for that type of application. But I unfortunately, I, just, I don't know of any of them that are coming out. It seems like uh, everyone's full. Well, out. I was going to say about the Hummer, GM owns the name Hummer, and they just brought that name back out. And that, I don't know if anybody knows this, but that Hummer EV weighs 9,000 pounds. Is it? <laughs> 9,000 pounds. Pounds. Yeah. Crazy yeah. monstrosity so of a vehicle. You want to have an idea, of how, you, you want to have a guess of how quick you're going to go through tires, because that's the one thing that doesn't get spoken is EVs will and wear out the tires faster versus the relative weight of a, of a comparable size car, because there's, it's the weight and acceleration, deceleration, I won't get into that, but the, the point here is it's a lot of weight. And the Hummer, GM is just, doing, no offense to GM fans, but GM just did that to grab attention. I, I think so, there's a market. I mean, it, it's, it's a niche thing, which is fine. I mean, who the hell needs a Model S that goes zero to 60 1.9 seconds? Nobody, <laughs> but it shows where EVs could go. So, um, anyhow, sorry. So, panel, uh, we started 15 minutes later. Are you okay going another 15 minutes? Oh, sure, yeah, fine for me. That's fine. Go ahead. Sure. So we're we're talking about electric vehicles, and he kind of went oh, to talk about a little bit uh, b larger vehicles. So, um, and one of the things that maybe would make a difference for folks living in cities would be to have more electric buses, right, and more mm -hmm. more public um, electrification of our vehicles. Um, and I'm wondering if you guys could talk about that a little bit and maybe uh, how, how, how feasible it is to, to transition um, the public infrastructure, public transportation infrastructure. And then also with the, um, with the um, towing a, uh, a fifth wheel, I, I have seen some um, news about um, putting uh, electric drivetrains in the vehicle that you're towing. And I'm wondering oh, if Inductive yeah. Auto Works has done anything that. about that. Yeah. 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 Okay. That. That's it. Pull that back over. Oh, we should do that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'll, I'll start with the, the driven trailer thing. Um, we have not uh, worked on anything like that. I've seen um, companies that come out with that, uh, have announced plans. Um, I'm going to be honest, from an engineering perspective, it kind of scares me. <laughs> Having a trailer that's then pushing on the vehicle. Um, I think it's possible, but there's going to have to be a lot of communication between that trailer and the vehicle and driver's age, things like traction coals, stuff like that is really going to have to be there and ready to step in. I mean, you have anything like trailer sway, any kind of limited traction conditions like that, um, that could get very dangerous very quickly, and I think that's why it hasn't been done yet. Um, the simpler version of that is a battery pack on the trailer, but then you also start to reach a point of diminishing returns where now you're increasing uh, the drag weight of the vehicle, of your tow vehicle, um, and is that really giving you appreciative um, range additions for money, right? What we've talked about here, battery pack is the most expensive part of any electric car. Whenever we do a build, two-thirds of our cost to the customer is to buy the battery pack. Um, so adding a battery pack to a trailer uh, to now get a small amount of additional range. And now you also have the challenge of running high voltage cables from the trailer to the vehicle. There's a lot of challenges with that. Um, again, it's one of those things uh, as an engineer, I've learned to never say never. Uh, I'll not say that nobody will ever figure that out, but I don't see that as an easy solution that'll be um, on the market quickly. You had another part of your question. I don't remember it. <laughs> Public transport, yes. I think uh, buses, public transport, anything where there's a lot of stop and go is such an ideal application for EV that it is as shocking to me that that was not the first place that this technology was adopted. Um, things like uh, school buses, inner city bus buses, anything where you have, um, I think the two keys there are a known route and always returning to a central depot are such ideal applications for EVs. Um, you know exactly how far you need to go every day. You're charging the same point every day. Um, 
and be able to get those things where stop and go is the least efficient for a gas vehicle and the most efficient for an electric vehicle, right? Electric vehicles, uh, efficiency drops off a little bit on the highway, but their most efficient is that stop and go where you can regen a lot of that power up to 80% sometimes. Um, so things like inner city buses and stuff like that. I mean, school buses. Every time I see a school bus passing me, belching out black smoke, I'm just floored that we're not putting more money into getting those converted to electric because they're such an ideal case. And I'm going to piggyback again. A lot sure. of piggybacking by me. So uh, the tech for mass transit, there's some really cool concepts that have already started to be tested. Heck, eight years ago they started to be tested. Like in Japan for their mass transit buses, they actually have charging that comes up through the road and it remotely charges the buses as they're driving over the road continuously. And then like when they pull off into the bay, right, where they pick up people or to park for a long period of time for some reason, they don't have to plug in, they don't have to do anything, it just starts charging the bus. In right? Europe, so, they have it where it plugged in from the top. It's quick, fast charging. So, like we've been saying repeatedly, right, the technologies are just going through the roof, right? Um, and mass, it's not hard for me to envision mass transit buses being predominantly electric within five to seven years, even, in, even in the United States. As he was saying, that's, that's the buses there, any vehicle, semis, that are at a depot overnight, that's the ideal candidate yeah. for, you know, I mean, Amazon's got a bunch of electric vehicles running around out there now. If the vehicle's sitting overnight, you know, it's going to charge, you know. You don't need overnight to charge, but that's, that's, a, different, that's a different topic. But um, you really don't need overnight. But, yeah, that's the ideal thing. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I think recently I just read that Massachusetts just bought, maybe it's another state, they bought a bunch of buses, school buses, that are going to be 100 percent electric. Hmm. They're coming, just not fast. They're coming. <laughs> other questions? It's just, the, it's just the cost. Yeah. Can you guys talk about maintenance and upkeep for the vehicles? You know, gas cars, oil change, all that stuff. What is the... I'm sure some of it is similar for the for electric and hybrid, but can you guys talk about a little bit of the differences and how much, like, is it a yearly visit to a garage or how does that all work? Mm -hmm. uh, start. Yeah, I'll uh, yeah. offer something. I here. can speak for my Bolt EV. Um, it has two forms of regenerative braking, and if you get used to how that works, putting your Hitting, hitting the brake with your with your right foot is your third option. Um, as a result, um, all of your braking apparatus, the pads, anything, uh, no trouble. I'm, I've I've done seventy five thousand miles. Original baked pads. Oh wow. Uh, yeah, just you got it's technique. You got to get used to how the car goes. Uh, I seventy five thousand miles. I'm um, going on four years. There is nothing has gone wrong with the car. Um, I check in every 33,500 miles, I think, and all there is is tire rotation. There's an inside air filter that gets changed. There is zero maintenance. And when you're talking about sticker shock, what people are missing is all the good stuff, which they look at the, they see the dollar amount, you know. But it's my car's been basically maintenance free. Yeah, I had pretty much going to echo that. Very, very limited maintenance with regenerative braking severely cuts down on brake wear. Uh, most uh, electric cars have a single speed gear reduction, so your oil change interval is something like 50, 100,000 miles, and it's a quart of gear oil, uh, basically. So, you know, anything that has moving parts does eventually need some kind of maintenance, but your intervals are just are so much less. Um, one kind of adjacent thing I'll say on that is uh, another kind of space where I think we need to see, and I hope we will, infrastructure grow is uh, secondary repair shops. Uh, so at, right now, obviously, if you have an EV, you're taking it to the dealership because it's under warranty. And right now, pretty much only your manufacturer dealership is trained to work on your car. And I'm hoping that's something we're going to see change as well. I mean, there's a huge... Um, it's not more difficult. It's just different knowledge that, you know, techs going through school and stuff like that need to have to work on 
um, EVs versus gas cars, right? There's a big perception it's more dangerous, it's more difficult. I don't think any of that's true. It's just different. Um, and to be able to train that next generation of techs uh, so we can still have the, you know, corner repair station, the mom and pop repair stations um, is going to be important for this kind of next generation of transport that we're, we're uh, starting our way into now. Um, as these vehicles come out of warranty, dealership visits are going to get expensive, and I hope that we soon have other options, and I think those kind of secondary industries will start popping up. So, uh, like he spoke about the boat, uh, with Tesla, uh, there's basically non-existent. Um, you're supposed to check your tires every 6,200 miles um, just to see if the tread needs to be rotated. Uh, yeah, rotate the tread. And see if the wheels need to be rotated. Um, every year, cabin air filter. That's it. <laughs> Washer fluid. Um, on the note of regenerative no braking, that when, when we say, when you hear the term regenerative braking, it actually has nothing to do with the brakes. It just means it's braking the speed of the car. So when you take your foot off the accelerator, your motor becomes a generator. So the resistance is what slows the car down. As I said earlier, I'm at 215,000 miles and I still have 50% of my original brake pads left. And that was measured by Tesla. I didn't pull it out of the air. I asked him, like, what's left? Like, eh, you're only halfway through. <laughs> so you can take out brake jobs, no oil changes, no tune-ups. Yeah, and you know what? It, it, it's the, that feeds into the earlier question about the cost of the vehicle. Yeah, you got to think about total ownership costs. Yeah, yeah. Is that something that isn't being um, thought about at all? Like, the advertising you when, when selling the car, I feel like it's like a big advertising point is, well, you don't have to pay for gas, but I feel like that's, a, and that's just kind of a general comment is, Maybe there should be more information around like the low cost of maintenance or minimal, you know. Yeah. That's that's a lot of cost in the long run. Is yeah. No oil change every yeah. thirty yeah. five hundred miles yeah. or whatever. But the dealers are incentivized to tell you that. Unless you're a hybrid. Because a vast majority yeah. of a dealer's that's, profits that's and revenue comes from financing cars. Yeah. And service, so they don't want you to reason. say, you know, yeah, we don't don't come back. So you're not going to need to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> It's, I've known people that have gone through their brakes on Tesla, and that's because they wait to the last minute and they jam on it. Yeah. <laughs> um, it it's, it's all on how you drive. I'm not saying don't. I've never done any of these hypermiling tricks. Um, I just drive the way I drive, and yeah. it is what it is. But um, maintenance is basically non-existent. It, it, it's, wow. and, and it's total cost, you know, you think about all the, Never mind, you can easily calculate the cost of what you save on oil changes and brakes and all that other stuff. Yeah. How about your time getting that done? Yeah. How much time have people stayed in line waiting to get the emissions check on their car? Yeah, don't have that anymore. Yeah. Now, if you live in Massachusetts or New York, they have an annual inspection regardless. Oh, it's an right. inspection of the car yeah. oh, it's a joke. versus just it's emissions. A joke. So you should get a discount. There's nuances to this we could oh, talk yeah. aside. Yeah, we could talk about... Can I bring up hybrids? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, what we just said um, about ease of maintenance, and it does not apply to hybrids. The plug-in hybrids, of course. Have uh, hybrids have got all the guts of a gas car. It's got all the guts of the electric as well. It's both. And yeah. the, the, what's going to betray you, you can probably guess, is you know if, if it's heavily used at least, um, the, the gas side of the car is going to drag you back in for maintenance, and and you know yeah. so. Go electric. It's got to be pure EV to get these great <laughs> right. benefits. I think we got time for one more decent question. Come on up. Decent question. So no if this is no pressure. <laughs> if it's not <laughs> decent, <laughs> not, not sure. If it, not not sure how decent it will be. But so I, I've been driving a Bolt also for four years or so. Very happy with it. Bought it originally as a second car because of range anxiety, and it turns out we drive that one 95% of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, the other one's a hybrid. Uh, but the question I have to some of you have over 200,000 miles on a car, I know on my car there's an option to uh, charge the car to various levels. I can charge it to 100%, I can charge it to 95, 85, whatever. So the implication there is that 
it may not be good to charge it to 100% all the time. That's right. Uh, because of life of the, you know, limiting the life of the battery long term. Uh, so I don't know if there's enough experience in the world to know that that really happens, but I'm curious to know what people do. do you, they do you, kill their batteries if they keep charging to 100% on a daily basis. How quick? Well, I don't have an exact number of how quick, but it, it's lithium ion batteries don't like heat. And charging to 100% and letting it sit there for hours on, on end is going to, it's going to shorten the life of the battery. I don't know exact number, but even Tesla says don't go to 100% uh, on a routine basis. On our screens, you can select anything between 50 to 90%. They consider a daily uh, rate. Um, even the 90% is, uh, you know, it depends on what you need. You know, I charge now to 70% because um, that's more than enough for, for my needs. Um, the only difference, the exception to this, and again, goes to battery technology, these uh, lithium phosphate batteries, you can charge 100% all day long. Yeah. It, 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 and let it sit there for hours on end. It won't do anything. It, it's, so I have to, in a way, I'm treating my old battery, shall we say, with kid gloves like it's a high mileage, well it is, but an engine, you know, you don't, if you keep redlining an engine, it's gonna live a very short life. So I'm gonna be a little bit more conservative with my charging because I don't want that big battery bill because my car is out of warranty now. <laughs> So, but these new batteries, don't worry about it, with, with the phosphate batteries. Yeah, we kind of touched on this a little bit, and the answer to that question is unfortunately not simple. It depends on the specific chemistry of the battery. So what that means is that it depends on the car you have and the year of the car you have as to what they were using. Um, you mentioned um, lithium phosphate batteries. Um, they're more stable, they're less energy dense, so they, kinda, they have their place, but uh, they don't care. Now, the, a, lot of the, a lot of cars now are using um, nickel manganese cobalt NMC cells. Um, they're in a lot of the higher performance cars, much higher discharge rate, um, more high performance, better energy density. They're a little bit more sensitive to things like overcharging. So the short answer, and by the way, that's two of a few dozen different types of chemistries <laughs> out there. Um, there's so much di uh, variety in batteries. Um, there is, you know, when somebody says lithium batteries, there is, like I just mentioned, a few dozen types of batteries under that uh, large umbrella. They're not all the same. In fact, they're all very different. Um, we will routinely choose different chemistries for different projects um, when, we're, when we're working on stuff. But uh, the short answer to that is you really, it really depends on your car. Uh, it depends on when your car was made as to what packs they were using at the time. Um, and I think, again, as you mentioned, battery technology, as we advance in battery technology, that's also going to become a thing of the past. Um, with more stable, more reliable cells that are happy with higher cycle lives, um, higher temperatures, things like that. That idea of charging less or charging to not 100% has become a thing of the past. But the answer is for right now, yeah, certain cars do benefit from that. So I'm going to, because we're wrapping things up, sure. and we've, all we've done is focus primarily uh, on the commercially produced electric vehicles that are out there. I did want to have a question sure. uh, about... Uh, rescuing an old vehicle that was a gas car mm -hmm. and converting it to electric. Yeah. Could you share a little bit of um, maybe the uh, what's the cost of just the conversion part? Sure. Um, and can you do it with like classic cars and you know, are there any sure. limitations and so on? Yeah, I'll do a little bit of a shameless plug here for <laughs> uh, my company. Yeah, so uh, like I mentioned earlier, we, we started this company because we saw a need for people that, you know, like their old classic cars but want to be able to uh, enjoy the benefits of EV. So all these things that are, you know, we talked about are great benefits of EV. Um, if you want to have that in the shell of a 63 Beetle, for example, um, you can do that. I kind of use that as a great example. It's a customer project we did end of last year. He had this... Uh, 63 Beetle that he learned to drive on, had been in his family the whole time. He was passing it down to his kids who were learning to drive. Um, already owned it, another electric car. I think he had a Tesla Model Y or something um, and really wanted to go for reliability and drivability reasons, you know, maintaining an old engine. Um, 
can be a fun hobby if you enjoy that, but if you want a car that you just want to drive, um, you're going to spend a lot of time tinkering, a lot of time in the garage. So um, going EV is a great option for that. So we were able to give him a drivetrain that was significantly more powerful, uh, so a funner car to drive, if you will, and also something that uh, is incredibly cheap to operate, as we mentioned, right? The, there's none of those maintenance. Your cost per mile for electricity is a lot less. So um, basically, the way I look at it is it gets cars that, you know, might be driven a few weekends of the year to something you can drive to work every single day, and it's going to be cheaper than your commuter car, uh, and have something that, you know, you have a nostalgic uh, connection to, or you just like a cool-looking uh uh, older car and being able to kind of bring those into the future and continue to hand them down and, and be enjoyed. You know, to me, a, to me, a car is only as cool as you can get to enjoy it, right? If you have a, a super rare uh, old car and because of that, it just sits in the garage all the time. I've always seen that as, as kind of a waste. If you're not enjoying it, um, getting it out there and driving it, um, kind of what's, what's the point to me? So we, uh, our whole thing was we help people, we help people do that basically. So, uh, unfortunately, I could go on forever about this stuff, uh, but we're a little over an hour, I guess, we spent, and thanks, everyone, for coming out. If, um, I do want to make mention, we do have a, a number of electric vehicles on display, inclu including a rebuild. Yep. What's, what's the model? We have a Mazda RX-8 out there that has actually the motor from a Nissan Leaf in it. Um, and so, I'm not quite sure what we ended up up there, but I know we're somewhere around 10 different vehicles at probably at least seven, eight different models uh, upstairs to the corner off of the uh, green. So come check them out. I know our Tesla owners are even willing to maybe give you a little test drive with their car if you want. If and you want the crap scared out of you, yeah. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the problem right there if we had the police involved in a certain section of the car. Zero to 60 seconds. Right? There you go. Right? As long as they're not in my rear view mirror. It's not a golf cart. It's not a golf cart. <laughs> On behalf of Winter Climate Action, and uh, I have to plug Central Connecticut State University <laughs> Geography Department, which we have degrees in sustainability and energy uh, related coursework. Um, Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. And so cut. Yeah.